good morning. It's nice to be with you in person this week after I know that you simply saw my face on the screen, which I never like being on a video, so I'm glad that we were able to make that work, but I much prefer to be with you in person. Uh, thank you for welcoming my family. Um, our two girls are visiting from Colombia for a month, for about five weeks, um, but our boys right now are in Mexico uh, with their mother, so um, you'll see a different version of our family coming soon, but um, it's wonderful to be here. When I was in the third grade, I had a crisis of faith. And you might think, how in the world can an eight-year-old have a crisis of faith? The answer to that is simply, I don't know. But it's the only way I can describe what happened to me in that moment, a moment that I still remember and can relive with great clarity. I went to Sunday school like I did every day from as long as I can remember, and the teacher was talking about heaven and how this marvelous day was coming when we would live forever and never sleep and never need to eat and never be sad and never cry. And I went home and laid awake that night terrified for this moment that was coming in the twinkling of an eye. I didn't know what it meant to have your eye twinkled. And I didn't know what it would be like to live forever. What did forever look like? What was the world like if you never got tired? How could you get out of doing things that you didn't want to do if you couldn't cry about it? <laughs> what did the whole thing look like? Would it be boring? With so many people, would God even have time to talk to me? What if I got locked out of heaven and had to spend forever alone? Scary questions with no answers for an eight-year-old. I talked to my dad who said, pray about it. But I said, well, that's the problem. I'm scared of praying now. <laughs> I talked to my mom who said, go to sleep and you'll feel better tomorrow. And I couldn't sleep. So I went to school the next day in my third grade class. And I talked to my only school friend who was also a church friend, a girl named Maria. I did not like Maria. She was kind of bossy and she cried if anything got on her clothes. And anytime we did anything wrong, she was the first one to tell. But at that point, I didn't feel like I had many options, so I asked Maria what she thought about heaven. She said, well, I don't want to go right now, <laughs> but I think it'll be nice someday. And I told her about my worries, and she said, do you believe in God? And I said, of course I do. Well, that's a stupid question. Well, she was probably thinking not as stupid as being scared of heaven, but she didn't say that. Instead, she said, well, how do you know God is real? And I said, well, I get goosebumps any time I think about God and how much God loves us. And then Maria said the most profound thing an eight-year-old could probably say, something I remember even today. I think that you should let those goosebumps be your answer. Just let mysteries be mysteries. Let mysteries be mysteries. Third grade was a long time ago. And as Plutarch, the ancient Greek philosopher and historian, wrote, time is the wisest of all counselors, or as Ecclesiastes tells it, to everything there is a season. What does that mean? That time matters. Even the most boring parts of our lives will become profoundly profound if we live long enough. Which means there are really two important things about time. One, it teaches, and two, it disappears. If that is true, then the purpose of time becomes loud and clear. It's not about accumulation. No, because in, a, in essence, a pile of time doesn't do anything for us. But the purpose of time is to awaken ourselves to ourselves so that we can become the only thing that truly matters, to be a totally deeply, wonderfully complex spiritual human being. But what does that mean? What does it mean to be deeply spiritual? Or to, as my little kid self-discovered, to feel God present at all times? Is it about religion or church? We come to church most of the time. We open ourselves up to things bigger than ourselves. Those of us who are here find value in this community. 
and we appreciate the ritual. But ritual and religion and spirituality are not the same things. It's way too easy to have one and not have the other. And in fact, it's possible to have all of it, religion and tradition and spirituality, and still miss the mystical elements in our daily lives. I mean, we can come to church our whole lives and never become drenched in God, fully immersed in who God is. We can practice our religion faithfully and still be far, far away from God. We can develop deep, deeply devotional habits but never recognize God's presence within us and with us. We can fail to see God here in this moment, in this situation, here and now. We can miss that moment of enlightenment, which we could say like the mystic Mathilde of Magdeburg. I see God in all things and all things in God. For as long as I can remember, faith was a pivotal aspect of my life. As a child, God was my best friend a humanoid superhero who could be counted on to stick it to the bad guys, to save my broken heart, to take care of me and to be my friend closer than my intuition when I was lonely. When I was sick, I clung to God and this being who understood me more than anyone else, for in third grade was also the year that I began to have issues with my kidneys and spent the next few years in and out of the hospital missing school and sports and times with other friends, and came to see God as that person who would keep me close when others could not be there. But as I got older, I began to worry about my own worth and my own mistakes. What if everything I believed and had been taught was exactly how it would be? But what if I was not good enough to make it? What if those gates of heaven closed and I was not on the other side? What if my own morality and obedience didn't measure up. Because I tried, but I still did things I knew I wasn't supposed to. These doubts and worries flickered in the back of my consciousness and ever the overthinker that I continue to be, I made it my personal quest to get real answers and assurance. I asked every person I ever met what they thought about God and what they thought about heaven. I read the Bible over and over and over to the point where I could quote it and tell you exactly where something came from and tell the pastor if he got it wrong. <laughs> I tried to find some kind of sign, some peace, something to make the doubt and the worry go away. I wrote in my journal trying to sort it out and make sense of this complicated relationship between doubt and faith. But I struggled. I was worried. I was afraid. Then when I was 19, in a moment of anxiety and doubt, I picked up a devotional I had had since I was 12. It was well-read and mostly forgotten, and I was trying to decide if I kept it or threw it away. And I opened to a random page, and a single line was suddenly illuminated. 1 John 4.18 There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. I read it again and again and realized something amazing. Love was the only thing that really mattered. How could I believe so completely that God loved me, that God loved all of us, enough to give me goosebumps and still be so afraid of what love was? If love was real, then I had no reason to fear. Love's greatest gift was not a get-out-of-hell-free card, but an opportunity to love with reckless abandon and make sure that everyone knew that one thing that was the difference between life and death. God, who is love, loves them. It wasn't an instantaneous transformation because transformation never happens in an instant. But I began a journey of discovering what real love is. I discovered a God who is not a human-like superhero who would rain favor on some and punishment on others but a God who is known by many names and many persuasions, who is the heart of the universe itself, a creative energy whose only real knowable characteristic was love. I began to see that being created in God's image didn't mean I looked like a man, but it meant that I could love and that I was loved. I began to see God not as flat and fitting in some kind of box, but brilliant and, and beautiful 
and larger than life itself, multidimensional, speaking every language and knowing all because all that mattered was love. I did not have the words to describe a God who loved like this. How could I possibly take something as infinite and universal and eternal and put it into human explanation? There was nothing containable about this new experience of God, but even so, I had a deep longing to know more. And this quest that continues to this day for me is greater than me. We are created more than human, I believe. We are created with a spark of divinity within each of us. This longing to know God more, to unravel the mysteries of the inexplicable, yet knowable creative universal force is what life on earth is all about. It's the very point of time. It's the call of Ecclesiastes. It's an awesome thought. As we search, we begin to discover that God is always present in and with us. God is in this moment, in this struggle, in this separation, in this great pain. God is in this loss, in this change of status, in this injustice, in this victory. God is in this moment of joy and this achievement and this birth and this death and this gathering and this casting. If life and love have something to do with God coming to life inside of each of us, then every aspect of our lives becomes beautiful. Even the points that are harder for us to understand or experience. We are not part of some grand experiment. God having placed us in cages like mice to give experiences and then watch and wonder as we act them out. We are not destined to do things simply because God told us it was so. No, God is in us, and we are in God. No matter what the circumstances may be, God is a part of all things. The gift of a lifetime is to come to recognize that, to embrace it, to accept it. And once we fully understand and accept it, nothing can destroy us because there is nothing greater than to be one with God. But I wonder why it's so hard for us to see God in us and with us. Why don't we notice God in all things? Why do we doubt God when we need that experience the most? Why don't we expect to see God everywhere at every moment? Two travelers were talking about the meaning of life, and the disciple asked his elder, <clears throat> where shall I find God in life? The elder said, God is with you everywhere. But if that is true, the disciple asked, why can I never see God? Because, said the elder, we are like fish who are in the ocean and never notice the water. Fish who never notice the water. God is all around us. Life is teeming with God's experience. And life is learning to experience God in the whispers and the winds, in the calm and the storm, in the waking and the sleeping. I believe that is what Wesley meant when he said we are moving on to perfection. We are being perfected in love. We are learning to experience the mystery of who God is and can be in us at every moment. Fish who live in the water don't appreciate the water because they don't know any difference. They can't feel the water until they're taken out of it. And then they know something's missing. Sometimes it's when we feel the farthest from God, we are made the most aware that God is ever present. Life's purpose then is to become aware, deeply aware, not only of the water, but of the other fish, the way that the water flows in and around and through each of them. But even more than learning to appreciate God in and around us, part of being deeply spiritual and awakened people who love more than we fear is to recognize how every bit of our own limited understanding of God is, we have the obligation to be that presence of God to others. We have the obligation to present a God who is multidimensional beyond our own limited vocabulary and expectation, and the way that we can do that is by our own loving actions. You see, every word we have falls short, but love makes the difference. We fear what we don't understand, and so we reject the mystery of a God who might be in favor of a smaller and safer version of God. 
an actual person with a name we can pronounce who is made in the image of us only slightly more powerful than human beings because that we can understand. A God who is emotional and capricious is one that makes sense. A God who is on our side makes even more sense. I think back to one of my favorite books, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe in the Chronicles of Narnia. And they were being introduced to Aslan. And the children asked the beaver, Aslan, is he safe? And the beaver laughed and said, safe? No, he's a lion. But he's good, I tell you. And maybe when we tell ourselves that God is good, despite the bad that we see and feel, and maybe when we remember that not everybody has a good experience of God and needs to see God not in the flags that we wave and the words that we say, but in the love that we show and share. Maybe that's how we truly understand and experience what Blaise Pascal said, that there is a God-shaped hole in each of us. Spiritual aliveness is the crux of human experience, and it is accessible to all of us. But I find myself wondering, what if we never experience true spiritual awakening because we're afraid of a God who is inexplicably mysterious? What if we are fish in the ocean, convinced that we live in a puddle, unwilling to open ourselves up to anything greater than us because it means that we have to, to admit that we just don't know? One of my favorite books, another one, is Paulo Coelho's The Alchemist. It's a novel that is full of spiritual insights and wisdom, far more than I have time to talk about today. I could preach sermons on that book, and though it was fiction, it spoke so many truths to me. In the story, the main character is Santiago, and he goes on a journey to find his personal legend, that is, the deepest desire of his heart. Along the way, Santiago is guided in ways he doesn't even realize by the hand who wrote it all, the name given to the higher power we might call creator or God. The imagery is beautiful, a universal creative spirit who is in and around and above all creative things. And on his journey, Santiago discovers that there is a universal language, a way of communicating understood by all of nature and all people. The author writes, there was a language in the world understood by everyone. It was the language of enthusiasm, of things accomplished with love and purpose, as a part of speech for something believed in and desired. As Santiago learned to communicate with nature, the alchemist told him, listen to your heart, it knows all things because it came from the soul of the world. The language of the world refers to the oneness of all things, that everything in the universe is tied together. And for me, as I processed the powerful words of this fictional story, and in my own way of understanding, that universal language is love. Love is the source of life and the purpose of life. Love is how we communicate without words when our words do so much to divide. Love is how we move from who we are to who we're meant to be. Love heals brokenness, and overcomes mistakes. And more importantly, love is the way we move from a limited God who is all about us to a God who is universal and is just love. We spend our lives searching for so many things, but only one is necessary, love. I think back to my third grade self's evidence of God. I believed in God because I got goosebumps. Even though I was afraid of heaven, at eight, I expected God to be near. And I wonder if you did too. As children, it's often easier to believe in the unknown and unseen because we listen with our hearts and we more easily speak the language of the world. What if today, instead of being grown-ups, jaded by life's experience, angry about the world as we should be, limited by what teachers and preachers and science and logic say must be true, what if we opened ourselves up simply to one thing, the mystery of a God who might be in an ocean that is bigger than any puddle we could imagine, trusting with our heart when it warms and when our skin tingles with goosebumps that God is indeed near 
and that our creator, the hand that wrote it all, is now and always. Amen. <laughs>